Well, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Zeev Haskell. Welcome to the latest installment in the ongoing now three-year series of University of Virginia Department of Radiology and Medical Imaging keynote lecture series. If you haven't looked back at our catalog, there are some extraordinary lectures um, that are as uh, valuable now as they were when they were first broadcast, but we have a particular treat tonight with a pretty compelling title, how the tsunami of health data impacts medical education and how to prepare for the next generation. And our keynote speaker tonight is Professor Michael Dake. If you're not aware, Dr. Dake was among the innumerable honors and positions that he held a past chairman at the University of Virginia, um, truly internationally recognized as a physician and health scientist um, with an H index of 102 and an I-10 index of 276. That's over 40,000 citations for his papers. He's currently Senior Vice President for Health Sciences at the University of Arizona. So when we think of department size things, Professor Dake was thinking about healthcare for 50,000 students at the early days of COVID. Um, endless chapters and 45 patents as well. As our discussants, a spectacular group, Professor Cree Gaskin from UVA, uh, uh, Vice Chair of Informatics and Division Chief, MSK Professor of Radiology, Medical Imaging, um, responsible essentially for the interactive multimedia reporting, electronic health records, data processing, optimizing processes in UVA, just a few of the things that uh, uh, Professor Gaskin manages on a daily and ongoing project basis. We have uh, Dr. Michael Spader, who is Associate Professor of Pediatrics in uh, Pediatric Clinical Care at University of Virginia, originally from DC, uh, trained at uh, Trinity College and a master's in statistics, uh, as well as uh, doing his critical care fellowship, Johns Hopkins. His research is based in the Center for Advanced Medical Analytics at UVA and focuses, among other things, on physiologic monitoring to identify patients at risk for clinical deterioration. And our last discussant, Professor Christopher Wald, who is the chair of the uh, Division of Radiology, vice chair of the hospital-based specialties at the um, uh, renowned Leahy Hospital and Medical Center. Um, Professor Wald, among many other uh, roles, has uh, uh, served as a medical staff president on the Board of Governors and also Vice Chair of Education and Chair of the GME Committees. Um, his specialties span many, including body imaging, advanced image processing, healthcare, IT. Did his original training at Bonn University Medical Center in Germany and ho has a business degree as well. Um, thanks, all of you. And with that, um, we're excited to have you. And uh, Professor Dake, the screen is yours. Thank you, Zeev, and welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm just going to get our screens teed up here. Whoop, hang on one sec. There we go. I would point out that I'm a mere, uh, the mere overture to the symphony of panelists that Zeev has introduced. And uh, also, I think, uh, hopefully speaking on behalf of Zeev, that we give you who are listening preferential opportunity to via chat ask any questions or clarifications on what we're talking about. Uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. And like I said, this is just a springboard to the more important discussion that will follow. These are my disclosures, none of which are really relevant to our topic tonight. And what again, what we're going to be delving into is the current sort of merger of of biomedicine and big biology with big data. Uh, essentially, this means integration of large-scale multidisciplinary data sets. And although this sort of merger of biomedical research and healthcare information systems can be somewhat daunting and to some people's mind, nowhere we need to go, uh, there's clearly an abundance of opportunities here that provide real value to everyone who's involved in delivering healthcare. Of course, we do have to take into account T.S. Eliot's quote there, and I'm sure we've all felt that sometimes trying to deal with healthcare information systems in the setting of trying to, to tease out biomedical data, it can be difficult. But fear not, 
there are a lot of connections going forward that I think we are all realize, as I mentioned, advantages from. There are, are admittedly oftentimes complex, uh, complicated, and, and uh, often highly matrixed. But I think we can see that between digital health, big data, and precision health, we are at, a, at entering into an era that truly is, may have up till now, the potential may have been a cliche, but now we're seeing all over the healthcare spectrum, tremendous opportunities that are being, uh, uh, being realized. And what are some of those? Well, I think we all have to admit that, at least when I trained, we often dealt with simply isolated data, and, and then merged into the areas of complex network data. But now as we enter complex computational data, this can afford all sorts of, of opportunities in terms of the questions that can be asked and the solutions we can provide. Such as deep phenotyping, the large scale data and prediction of complex traits with disease risk. And whether that's in multiomics, and profiling large volume of cohorts with stringently clinically phenotype uh, profiles, uh, or whether it's mapping genetic overlaps between different diseases involving shared pathogenic elements and comorbidity risk. Uh, it's touching really every aspect of medicine today. Here's just an example. I mean, I could pick many. This is just one that is tracking the genetic overlap between stroke and related vascular traits. Uh, this is something that I think uh, uh, we're all aware it uh, with with our abilities to deal with machine learning, uh, deep neural networks, and and complex bioinformatics that we're really able, I think, to to make strides where we're into areas we've never gone before. And uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, oh, what has happened here? I've sort of lost my ability to move forward for some reason. Let's see, why would that be? Well, let's just see. Uh, we were going along just fine and now I'm just getting bonk, bonk, bonk. Zeev, any ideas? Let's just, let me see what I can do. We bounce you out and restart. Hmm. There we go. I'll just do it in a different way. Uh, and this is just another example of the overlap between age-related psychiatric disorders and other brain disorders. 36,000 36, individuals, uh, a range of years, and 16,000 healthy adults. You can see that this is, this is something where radiology and imaging can really play a role as we go forward. Okay, uh, but now comes the hard part because we have to drive this precision medicine and data-driven healthcare into routine clinical practice because that's really, I mean, there's whole area of implementation science. How do we take things, all this wonderful research we're doing and actually bring it into practice so that everyone can benefit? Uh, this involves out of necessity teaching those of us old dogs new tricks and the current generation and generations to follow new skills, uh, skills in terms of cognitive computing, decision support systems that really overcome the bandwidth limitation of human individuals, be it our expertise, our ability to think in multiple dimensions, limits to our sensory systems, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where, of course, this reaches the lay press and all of these ideas about, you know, from robots to AI to deep learning that I think uh, is out there. And many of our patients actually expect uh, somehow that we are at a place where we may not be yet, but they are aware that these type of tools are coming into medicine and should impact their life. This is the uh, CEO of Kaiser Permanente uh, talking about artificial intelligence, pattern analysis, and medical practice. I don't think any physician today should be practicing without artificial intelligence assisting in their practice. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. It's just impossible otherwise to pick up on patterns, to pick up on trends, to really monitor care. Now, that's, I mean, that's sort of stunning to many of us. 
And from a Nobel laureate in economics, another way to look at it, one thing a person cannot do, no matter how rigorous his analysis or heroic his analysis or heroic his imagination, is to draw up a list of things that would never occur to him. Again, I think about this, you know, not infrequently, that when we something comes up, how did, where, how did someone think of that? And many times it isn't a human that, that really brought this to life. And we're seeing this across the spectrum of, of clinical medicine. Just an example of four specialties that are using machine learning with image analysis to really, I think, bring benefit to patients, whether it's pathology, radiology, dermatology, ophthalmology. I won't go into a lot of specifics because I'm sure it'll come out in, in conversation and you're aware of many of them already. And obviously this is not, uh, the market is not blind to this. The health AI market is exploding. Uh, as you can see from 2014 to 2021, there's been an 11X growth in the size of the AI market. Uh, uh, this is, you know, to be expected, and we see this every day. I'm always asked by students, trainees, others, how do we get into this? How do we get these skills? How do we acquire the knowledge? Where do we get trained in this? And that's the challenge that we all have as educators. Now, I said there was a hard part, but there's also a, a sort of little hidden thing behind a, a shadow hard part, which is called the really hard part. And that's the problem with real world data is that unfortunately, it's real world. And as we delve into this, we have to recognize that, that now as we deal with medical research, clinical care, we also have to deal with daily life where every monitored event is a potential data point. Every individual is a data node. Every individual is a research asset and every individual is their own control. And this creates challenges, privacy challenges, et cetera. Having said that, it's, it's undeniable, it's inevitable that the future of healthcare resides with precision medicine and digital medicine and the convergence of these two. And what I mean by that is you see the extended scare space with remote monitors or implantable monitors or whatever, lifestyle metrics, et cetera, consumer patient engagement with all the new technology pl uh, platforms that, that play into deep phenotyping and risk profiling. But you put it all together and the center sits big data. And that's what we're gonna explore with the panel tonight. So I think it's fair to say uh, that those healthcare systems that really don't take this on seriously, that really don't initiate programs to look at, at these opportunities, there will be a digital Darwinism with time, a digital divide that really, I think, separates the haves and the have-nots. Uh, I think clearly the ability to understand data structure and application will improve decisions and outcomes, and this will be clear, and that health systems that don't employ this may be left behind, and there will be gaps and, and personnel shortages in skills. Um, clearly, training of new cadre of data sciences is required, whether they're medical or non-medical, but inevitably the institutions that lack adequate computational infrastructure and critical mass and data analytics will suffer cognitive starvation and relegation to competitive irrelevance. So what does that do? We're gonna shift now to trainees and learning, which is kind of my responsibility at the University of Arizona in the five colleges that I have to sort of watch over. And that clearly means new patterns of learning. And this is sort of, we're getting to the end of this little springboard. And as you are well aware, there's been major transitions in medical education and healthcare from science centric to healthcare as a learning system to now this new phase of massive data and network centric mastery of exhalating complexity. This data deluge is really, and we see it in all our trainees now really important and it's important in radiology to our clinicians when it comes to decision support, when it comes to future medical education, how do we really maintain our professional competency in the setting of uh, the limits of our cognitive bandwidth, the limits of our knowledge of automated analytics and decision support, 
et cetera. Uh, I was telling Zeev the other day that when he was at BU, Noam Chomsky was there. Noam Chomsky is now a professor at the University of Arizona, of all things. And I heard him say this a year or so ago at, at, at a lecture where he said, if you're teaching today what you were five years ago, either the field is dead or you are. And I think that's, you know, it's a little stark, but it, it, it's kind of, it's relevant. In the 21st century, we're clearly going to see that knowledge capture and curation is going to change. Teaching students have to, we have to make them, allow them to distinguish between information and knowledge and stressing knowledge capture and curation, not information retention. This, I think we all understand how we put it into practice and allow our students and trainees to benefit is another matter, but this is clear and I see it every day. Also deep understanding of probabilistic reasoning is key. Uh, understanding probabilities and communicating and applying them meaningful meaningfully is important. Uh, we are now very involved with how we train students in biostatistics and bioinformatics so that they have the tools necessary to allow collaboration within management of AI applications. Uh, and of course, with all this, there always needs to be an eye towards cultivating empathy and compassion in our interactions. Uh, Closing with healthcare systems. There's a lot of talk about the learning healthcare system. Uh, I don't know if people consider it a cliche, but I think there is value in thinking about this concept. Uh, today, when we think about the learning healthcare system, that means shifting from qualitative descriptive information of variable provenance and quality to quantitative data of known provenance and validated quality, and shifting from a complex ecosystem of largely unconnected data sources to an evolving interconnected networks of data sources for robust decisions and improved care. But the basic concept of a learning healthcare system, I think, persists, and we'll talk just briefly about that. So what can we do to ensure we are responding to the 21st century educational challenges? I think all of us need to look at, no matter what institution we're currently working at, at how we train students to be maximally effective 21st century practitioners. We have to really focus and honestly explore why and how our curriculum should be different from any other schools. I have some thoughts on that. We need to commit to reimagining every aspect of education and training in a meaningful, you know, uh, uh, way that I think really is intentional. And we need to identify strategies to overcome institutional inertia, which is always going to exist. And that means, again, always keeping an eye on ensuring cultivation of compassion that permeates every aspect of our curriculum. This is the learning healthcare system basics, the so-called virtuous circle, which means investment, whether no matter what the healthcare system's thoughts are about research, they need to understand and be enlightened why research helps drive this circle in terms of clinical volume, in terms of profile, in terms of prestige, et cetera. And that leads to increased patient referrals, et cetera. So the tripartite mission of education, research, clinical service fits into this circle to make this something that's self-reinforcing and I think is, is, is the true value we all hope to achieve. How will this help? Well, in the future, once we work to our best to uh, establish a, a, and create a learning healthcare system, I think we can really start to take advantage of what that allows us to do in this virtual cycle of connecting education, research, and patient care that continuously acts in a feedback loop, one that is supporting the other and actually enhancing the other. So how will this all play out? Uh, you know, this is my, always my Venn diagram. You don't have, I mean, we all have limited bandwidth. We all have limited time. You know, I, I think we can only concentrate on things that matter in the overlap with things that we could control. This is where we should focus. So uh, 
I'm trying to make the case that this where we, this area right here is an area that's valuable. And then going forward, there are going to be many times, as I am daily, in a situation where I don't really understand what people are talking about. I have either not the intellectual capabilities or potential to really grasp this, but like this fox, I sort of just hang in there and act as if I know what I'm doing. And usually that works out or has worked out pretty well for me. So again, going forward, some of this is stressful. Some of this perturbs our basic comfort level, but by keeping calm and creating innovative joint projects, finding people in your institution that are experts in this, that we're willing to collaborate because they don't have the secret sauce of clinical uh, care of patients, et cetera, but that's really what drives them. There are tremendous collaborative synergies that exist today. So in conclusion, uh, we're at a period of great innovation. Uh, opportunities are going to continue to grow with technological advances that promise to impact clinical practice and transform medicine and medical education. The pace of change is rapid. Thinking outside the box is essential. The potential impact on medical care, however, is enormous. And finally, we all have to remember to have fun as we prepare for these truly inevitable developments. Thanks very much. Mike, thank you. Uh, provocative, certainly. Let's bring up all our discussants. Um, and uh, I think your uh, mic's live, all of you. Any opening comments from any of you? You know, Mike, I'm struck by, by, by two things. First, you're talking about the need for scale because of the sheer numbers required to get this kind of, to, 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 um, to find that secret sauce or signal and develop these types of processes. And at the same time, trying to think at an institutional level or an individual system level, how you, you build these things out, be it how do you um, uh, collaborate with people about uh, new algorithms or new tools? Is it really bringing in those tools that are being developed outside or are you thinking about how we train what kind of providers to develop these tools in our own institutions? What are these people going to look like as students and learners? Yeah, I think good question, Steve. I, I see this as sort of a bi-directional gyra in and out with very porous walls in the academic. It's no secret that anyone, to anyone that the pandemic has created losers and winners. And right now, healthcare systems are winners relative to community hospitals for a number of reasons. And going forward, the system and making sure the system is enlightened when it comes to these sort of things we're being discussed will further create this a divide that I think is going to benefit those who work in large systems. But having said that, what comes out of those systems can certainly benefit you know, the entire healthcare spectrum, community hospitals, global information, et cetera. What right now we have programs where, uh, I don't know if, I can't even remember if UVA has a program where they take students right out of high school and in seven years they become, uh, have an MD. And most of the programs around the country, for example, after seven years, you get your BS and you get an MD. We've decided we, we wanna do something different so that our students after seven years get a master's in any one of the 21st century curriculum uh, issues, whether it's epidemiology, statistics, bioinformatics, AI, et cetera. So they get a master's to specialize in as well as an MD. And we want to train that next generation. And we want people to be very interested in, I, I have a bio, many places, biostatistics, and I'm going to be quiet in a second, let the panel weigh in, but biostatistics is different than bioinformatics. They live in different worlds. Ours are together. And that biostatistics, bioinformatics department is well over 45 FTEs. And they are, you know, it's a very robust source of our investment right now. Christoph, how, um, uh, uh, 
have you have you thought about how you incorporate AI into your department or what's the lay he doing or across the the the, the Harvard system? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much and wonderful overview, uh, Dr. Dick. Thank you for for bringing us uh, up to speed here. Um, at Leahy, we, we decided uh, about five years ago to begin uh, bringing in some available clinical AI application at the time in, in imaging. It was not so much because I necessarily thought that radiologists desperately needed help with diagnosing any of these conditions, uh, to say it simply, but really to for, for all of us that are in clinical production to get our hands on this technology and learn what it can and cannot do, I wanted the informaticists to have a chance uh, to, to figure out how, how easy or difficult is this to stand up an individual platform or to stand up a platform vendor and then stand up systems on the platform vendor. And so how easy is it or how difficult is it to connect these systems with what we work with every day? Um, and that's actually, um, that was really done to develop the core competencies across the interdisciplinary team to deal with this technology. And so I, I don't think we've reaped massive clinical benefits, to be honest. Uh, we have about 10 of these things in production at this point. But we've learned a lot about how to, how to look at the results, how to expose the results in our production systems, how to visually represent them to radiologists. We learned about you know, how that impacts care, um, how we can reorganize our work when that's maybe not appropriate to do. Uh, how uh, these things can be wrong and how do you fail safe for that. Uh, so a whole bunch of learning that's really been going on and, and that's been a fascinating journey. Um, one thing I wanted to build on, uh, which is something that Dr. Dake said, as we take this technology into real clinical practice, we're constantly running into the limitations of the production systems that we that have been built to function in a certain way, and they're pretty hardwired and firewalled against each other. And so when you said hell is the place where nothing connects, when you quoted that, um, we are we have connected systems, but the language they speak and the messages that they send are not interoperable. So there's really a lack of, of standards um, in the way that the various systems we use in clinical medicine encode information. And that was really a, a long-term obstacle to making them all work well together, including data science. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think with the ACR, we're sort of trying to move along projects that support that, such as you know, RAD elements together with RSNA, which is sort of a common data element library that can be used across multiple systems so that each system knows what the other is talking about. Um, there's a newer one for anatomic locations, which sort of builds on that. Uh, again, you know, sort of large scale efforts to try and introduce some standardization in the industry so that these IT systems can really meaningfully talk to each other. See, could I, could I um, go back to something that Dr. Dick was sort of alluding to? And I think it, it sort of references the question in the Q&A. Um, so, you know, I'm coming from this, I'm not a radiologist, I'm coming from this both as a data science researcher, but also as an educator. Um, and I think one of the main issues is an issue of uh, sort of assessment of data literacy. I lead, you know, I teach uh, the biostatistics that all the medical students at UVA receive in, in August, beginning of their first year, they get, I get 50 minutes, five zero minutes for their entirety to teach them biostatistics. Um, I get six hours with the pediatric subspecialty fellows. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's interesting because you can put Bayes formula up there on the screen when I'm doing a probability um, um, session and everyone clamps down. But I think to Dr. Dake's point about sort of trying to demonstrate or convey to learners the idea that we're all Bayesians, right? We're all using conditional probabilities and all the decisions that we're making at the bedside or when we're evaluating um, the data that we receive. We have prior probabilities, we receive new data, and that that new data provides us with a dynamic updating of new, new probabilities. And so I think we need to somehow demystify some of the statistics um, and some of the language. Um, I think when you're dealing with learners and their interactions with you know, in my field, predictive analytics, I think really sort of letting them see what's under the hood, trying to give them some uh, um, 
basic understanding of what's driving um, what what the data is that they're receiving um, in terms of helping them make clinical decisions, I think um, that's going to be a big step. And Dr. Matsumoto's question, I don't know who the right people are to do this. <laughs> um, I think you have to have people who live in both worlds. And, and I think right now um, that is, um, those people are, are, are sort of rare birds. Are, are we going to be selecting different type of trainees in order to go down these different types of paths for different specialties? Or do we, uh, you know, for different characteristics, are we going to have a revolt of saying that this is not kind of humanistic medicine? Or, or are we expecting these to turn into sort of seamless incorporated into EMR tools that, uh, th that are simply going to be bolt-ons to our routine? I, I was thinking about uh, Mike's slide where he kind of near the end, it said, keep calm. And I think that's something that's important to remember. I do think there's a, a fair amount of, some people feel stress, overwhelmed or big data. Gee, I have to understand that to be part of the future. And I think that for the average physician, I think you can use tools that are made available to you that are actually useful. And, and to date, there aren't that many that are in our hands. For some perspective, back in 1998, my cousin, who has a PhD in AI back then, said, why are you training in radiology? Because I was a resident at the time. And he's like, we already have computers that can read images. And he wasn't just teasing me. He was dead serious. Why are you training in this? I said, you don't understand radiology. And he said, you don't understand AI. <laughs> I said, I said, all right, well, that's probably fair. But, you know, you get to 2015 and it was still looking pretty good. And then there was all this big splash in the, in the industry and about how AI was going to make radiologists obsolete. And everyone kind of got scared. And here we are eight years later. And there's not much game changing happening. So there's a lot of, you know, medicine is hard. There's a lot of doctoring to do. And people who want to be doctors can be doctors. Uh, this next generation, I think for, for development, um, for changing care, I think it probably makes sense to have people in niche areas uh, who want to partner with people in data science and work together. Um, you know, I find that as a radiologist, when I work with a vendor in informatics, together we do more together. Like I, we may have some ideas and then the technical folks can help make it happen. And without each other, we don't get anywhere, but together we get somewhere. So I don't know that it's critical that every physician learn to be a data scientist by any means. I think that, you know, they just need to stay calm and, and do what they enjoy doing. And these tools will come. Uh, as one example, we are accelerating how fast our MRIs are being done. So we, we use AI to accelerate how fast the sequence is performed. And we may do a knee MRI in 12 minutes and it used to be 20 minutes. The radiologist reading those images, the clinician ordering that study, they may not even know that AI was used. The images look the same. And those tools are just improving care and you could still just read the images. Uh, and if you have AI that helps to read the images, that's great. Um, Christoph, I appreciated what you said, how about five years ago, you started to put in some AI in your institution kind of just to get your feet wet. And, and so everyone could start to see what it was like. And UVA had a similar approach where we put in algorithms just so people could see what it would feel like but you know here we are years later and things aren't that different at least in terms of how the radiologists practice what's this going to look like for orthopedic surgery or general surgery well, i mean for example for these kinds of um, pick up your knife and fork and practice medicine um what are we imagining that 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 that, that big data is going to do in these kinds of situations I guess we could all try to answer that. I, I mean, it's it's hard to know what you you know don't know. Whatever you know, Mike's slide said. You know, it's hard to know what's what's going to happen. But um, 
I could see it helping them construct a note. So you may have uh, an algorithm that's listening to the conversation and constructing the clinic notes. So they may spend their time talking to the patient and the notes getting created. So that, that might be a, a benefit. I've, I've imagined that same kind of thing in which active listening in the setting of a hyper-pressurized visit might cue kinds of questions that 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 are are, are considered on the fly. You know, I, I I remember visiting a large hospital in China with uh, with uh, 43 sinks for cleaning endoscopy units. They were doing that many endoscopies, and I was told by a prominent clinician that he was given four minutes to see a patient. And this was considered culturally acceptable, and they could work quickly enough in terms of making decisions. Astonishing when we feel like we're pressed. But the idea that something might cue me to the things that I don't know, you know, that 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 idea that within the first two or three minutes, you've already decided what that patient in that office actually has, and you cease to hear new information. You know, how is, is it going to get into that level? Of, uh, well, I think, go ahead, I agree you were going to... Uh, Say something. Oh, no, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say that, I mean, the whole idea of taking unstructured chart notes and having hypotheses and then just having drawn out to, I mean, not like you're on a fishing ex expedition, but pulling stuff out is already reaping some very interesting findings, you know, uh, for example, uh, and a lot of it's not coming from, at least in our experience here, is not coming necessarily from medicine it's a lot's coming from public health so for example i'll just give you an example real world example that we have an extreme interest in firefighters and the health of firefighters and with the tucson fire department we've developed a national network of other firefighters very we're, the number one cause of death in firefighters is cancer okay by far and so whether is what's the risk is it forest fire? Is it urban fire? Is it structural, et cetera? We can tease all this. It's very interesting to tease this out and to really, you know, when a firefighter logs in and logs out, none of this information has been traditionally available. They just uh, went on a run, you know, three o'clock to four o'clock or something. You don't know what kind of blaze they were fighting, what they were doing. All of this now can be built in and then pulled out to see. Same thing uh, if you if you take like, we found out that people who work swing shifts as firefighters, the night shift, and after two weeks, take the day shift, back to the night shift, whatever. And this is only from these big data sets, not just here in Tucson, but over the whole country, they have a much higher risk of cancer. Just from that alone, from these swing shifts. Likewise, age match women firefighters have a much higher risk of preterm labor, all of these, you know, early menopause, et cetera, you know, and again, you can track that for what is it? And it turns out our experience says it's the wildfires, not the urban fires. Now, it's just very, I mean, so much interesting stuff that we could never actually get so, in so, position so to Mike, look at. Yeah. To, so to kind of to to pick up on that, but also push back. You know, you look at you look at where we ultimately need national data as patient safety, and we have these isolated pockets of large systems that aren't going to communicate because of barriers of sharing. You know, the 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 national data states are very crude. Um, uh, you know, state and national ones in terms of level of information because they're just as barriers. To, to get that kind of granularity where it's privacy or it's considered um, you know, un uncrossable lines, that's where we need you know, millions. Well, I, I, as you, you're 100% right, and, and we need to be very sensitive to privacy. This is where large systems have an edge that can actually get a spark of some intuition to what's going on, collaborate with other systems, so not just physicians collaborating one with the other, but systems collaborating. But it's it's, it's dynamic, Zeev. You know, you're, you're right now, but I think the value of this will become increasingly prominent and that people will, you know, find ways to get collaborative efforts when it comes to data. It, it's slow, but I'm, I'm convinced that the benefits, the, the dividends are just incredible, you know? Christoph, you were trying to jump in. 
Yeah, I wanted to jump in on on what you had asked, Steve, and that was um, you described the scenario of the physician that has to make the decision quickly, digest enormous amounts of information. I'd posit that both the physician and the patient have that problem at some point. The physician may have it under great time pressure, and then the patient walks away a lot of information that they don't understand. So both buckets of information are really encoded in natural language. And uh, where I'm going to go with this is I don't know how many of you have platted played with chat GPT in the recent weeks and months. Um, it is really good at organizing and classifying and sort of summarizing um, natural language and information that's encoded in it. And I wanted to share an experience that I had while I was doing that. I've done that with medical and with non-medical stuff, and it really looks very promising. I think this is uh, super transformative technology. Here's what, what happened to me. Um, I found myself, as I was asking the system ever more precise questions with ever more specific things that I wanted to know about something, I found myself worrying more about what it is actually that I wanted to know, rather than the act of finding it. And I'm dreaming of the day when I can practice radiology or my clinical colleagues can, can practice clinical medicine and they can ask the questions that they think are relevant for the patient in front of them and not worry so much which of the 57,000 charts notes that's buried in uh, which lab table that they cannot find, but really sort of hone in on that prompt engineering on how do I ask the right questions and how, how do I build the next question on the answer that I get either from the system or the patient. And I think there's a real promise there to, to focus our clinical practice again, because we're drowning in data retrieval and scout work. Yeah, that's, I think, don't you think that you've hit a hot button there? You know, the worst quality of life aspect of, of, of American physicians is the electronic medical record. Right. And patients have become used to seeing the backs of their healthcare providers. Right. As, as part of a visit. And we look at notes that we generate or, or otherwise they're essentially copy pastes. Right. Exactly. There's almost no natural or, or, or original thought. This is simply a continuation and an endless handoff. Yeah, and I, I, again, I found myself in the interaction with the system to be refocusing on what is actually what it actually is that I want to figure out, rather than how to get there. Uh, so that was that was liberating, and I hope that we can eventually find safe and effective ways of bringing that into our daily lives and clinical practice. We have we have we we have an echo on that comment from Martha Helms from the. Um, from the audience about uh, how, as a pediatrician, can you convert active listening and subjecting information into data in real time as you're eliciting it from patients? Or, as you've said, in the reverse, how can they leave with a packet? I think there's a 1960s New England Journal paper that showed sort of the, the, the hyperbolic drop of, of, of information when the patient hears it, and then an hour, and then six hours, and I think it was 24 or three days later where it basically just sort of drops to the line. You know, and once you say cancer, everything else sort of disappears. So we also need to, we, we, these systems also need to package for us, as we've said. You know? yeah, there, there's something else that I think we, we must not forget. And that is um, all of these probabilistic systems, every now and then they fail catastrophically. And in fact, I asked ChatGPT, I said, are you always right? And the answer was, from time to time, and ChatGPT is very polite, from time to time, I give completely believable but erroneous answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where I'm going with this is uh, to the comment of the last colleague who posted in the chat is the following. Um, yes, you do need a clinician who not only has used their sensory system to really understand what's going on with the patient to the degree that you can, but who's also knowledgeable enough to validate the output of these systems, of these assistive systems, because the patient who ultimately has to decide, am I going to have surgery? Am I going to take chemotherapy? Is not going to do that based on a chatbot output. They're going to want to know whether their physician agrees with that output and whether the physician validates that that direction is the right direction to take. That's the trust currency that is not going to come from a chatbot for a very long time. And I think that's a little bit of our physician competitive advantage in that modern world. I think that's a, an absolutely great point. You know, the, the past physician might read the lab value, stare at the EKG for a while and try to interpret it. And, and we'll still do those things. But increasingly, 
we're going to be interpreting output from various systems. So you may have algorithms that read your images or read the chart or physiologic parameters and suggested some diagnoses. And it's our job to interpret whether it's correct or not. Is this valid information useful or not? And I don't think it's replacing. It's just kind of changing the inputs that we're considering. Yeah. And they're going to facilitate our consumption of more data. But we still, you still have to be the doctor that's interpreting what's available. It's just a different source for the future. Yeah. I think so, a great example of that is in genetic counseling. As you know, genetic counseling is not a service that is reimbursed by anyone. Genetic counseling is not yet. We're sequencing everyone. And you just see we're in this zone right now that is unstable. That has got to change. Mm -hmm. It's a dynamic thing. And how, we're not, you know, Cree, you and I, you know, here's all these things. How do we interpret, you know, if someone gets sequenced for something and all this comes out? It's a, it's, to me, I find that very interesting in terms of our response in genetic counseling. And there's there's an increasing number of um, pieces of information that we generate collateral to what we do. For instance, whether it's brain cortical mapping or pulmonary emphysema quantification by AI or mapping uh, how much inflammation you've got going on in your liver when you've got steatohepatitis and what risk you might be at for, for progressing to cirrhosis. Those are all outputs that honestly an individual um, physician cannot validate, uh, you know, at face value. I can't say whether that emphysema score is right or wrong, but I can integrate that information to Cree's point with all else that's known about the patient, including I've just listened to them and can say, you know, it all makes sense. You know, I, I don't know whether 950 is the right number, but, you know, they've got emphysema. They can barely finish a sentence. So, so maybe let's take it back to training, which is what you also put on your, you know, as, as your opening gambit on your title, which is how does this get incorporated into training? How do you train people to still be critical thinkers and not dependent on analyses that are done for them? And uh, I mean, how, how's this going to get into sort of early years as we age past this and the generations need to replace us? I think that's a question for Michael. I mean, he's got the experience. I can tell you real quick what we're doing is we're, well, one aspect is we have a very unique opportunity that we're starting an international medical school, the University of Western Australia called Global MD. And we're putting that right in the upfront into the early training of, of students. We also have a program called Health Science Design, which uses design thinking to problem solve. And one thrust of that is AI, where you get students, undergrads, grads, mash them up together in groups and work with experts in machine learning, deep neural networks, et cetera, on projects. And that has a ripple effect. And, but I'd love to hear what Michael thinks. Well, I mean, it's hard. I, I think, you know, we've, we've adopted this milestone model, you know, where they sort of this graduated, you know, independence and, and, and learning. And in many respects, I think even with some of the very initial interactions that trainees have with data and technology, they've lost some of the sort of foundational um, parts of learning clinical reasoning. And so I'll give you a quick example. I was on service last week. All of, all of my residents in the ICU walk around with computers that has the EHR up with their notes auto-populated with data. Uh, and then I have a fourth year medical student um, poor guy doesn't get a computer. He's got to write everything down. Guess who knew the data better? Mm -hmm. The fourth year medical student, because he had interacted with it. He wrote it down. He had sort of had to think about it. So as he's reading it, it's not the first time he's seeing it. He's already processed that I'm going to explain, you know, this, it, I'm going to interpret this blood gas. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a respiratory alkalosis and, 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 and on and on. And so I think what I fear is, is that we have forgotten about some of these sort of foundational steps and that we really need to establish with the learners that they sort of have that baseline before they, they, they graduate to the next step. And then that is sort of bringing in the data and interacting with it in that way. And then, you know, then how do they deal with 
uh, decision support? Um, how do they learn how to sort of um, process what they're, I mean, get back, I think Christoph said this, how do you interpret what the clinical decision support tool is and sort of make that as just another piece of data, not necessarily like you must do this. And so how do you sort of make that happen? I mean, do you imagine this reducing the sort of the, the the brute force amount of memorization that is that has been so much of this classic medical school that, that this oh, presumption yeah. that if you learn all these things, you will carry them in the head in your head for the rest of your career, you know, as they as they slowly leach out, and that we're going to be replacing with tools that are just going to let us access this information when we need it. I mean, how how, how really is this going to change our training? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but the fear is back, you know, getting back to chat GPT, it's funny, I was just at a data science uh, um, summit for pediatric critical care, actually, when I was asked to be on this panel. And um, one of the speakers was entering in sort of patient scenarios, like, write me a patient note for a for a patient on this kind of ventilator, you know, a nine-year-old with ARDS on this sort of ventilator. And the output was not, <laughs> not necessarily um, uh, realistic. And so I do, I do think there's, there's still, you know, my wife's in education and she's very worried, like, will, will any high schooler ever write a term paper ever again now that chat GPT <laughs> exists? But I do think it's not, you know, there's a lot of problems with this. And so I think it's a little bit of a cautionary tale for our, for our medical students. Like they can't, you know, it's, this is not something they can rely on right now as they're learning to help them write notes. Um, yeah, the road to progress is always under construction, but I feel, I feel that this is gonna, you know, I don't know if you ever saw that movie uh, Alpha Go where they, have you, have you seen that anyone no oh it's a great movie where you know where big blue played somebody in chess this is deep mind out of england playing the number one nine ten go player in korea who's the grand master and uh, i won't go any further but you might want to watch it it's very interesting yeah so so you you brought up some themes that have echoed in our chat from the audience from two uh, two of our participants have given great comments on how do we pace this in the training um, so that people are acquiring skills of clinical reasoning. And another one of our uh, participants who's basically saying that they're seeing trainees sort of just accept the data at face value without applying the reasoning to it. And there's the risk that these surrogate analyses or analyzers are going to even further that, which is I can rely on this tool and take it at face value. How is this, you know, what do we have to do as sort of guardrails or not for ourselves or for modeling it for students? I, I think one way maybe to think about it is, is that these particular systems um, can help you deal with a problem at scale, but first you have to learn how to deal with the same problem uh, at, you know, at, at a low end. In other words, uh, you got to solve that problem manually a few times, and then we'll release you eventually uh, to solve the problem at scale with support, because you still, you, then you will have enough ability to validate. Um, so I, that, that's how I would pace it. So it's an air gap <laughs> before you get to. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it basically says okay. you know, that that system is there to assist you. Well, you got to learn how to interact with it, but it's there to assist you when you have to do this fast and at scale. And we need to train you to the point that you can recognize when it's wrong, because it's not a question if, but when it's going to be wrong. And you got to be fit to recognize that. Yeah, I think the other issue is I think the pace at which the technology is developing is far faster than our ability to study with about how we inter, uh, interact with it and how we sort of integrate that into our workflow. So I do think this is a very interesting you know, field of medical education research or these sort of the idea of these sort of virtual learning labs. It's sort of these AR, VR environments where you have learners in this sort of safe environment interacting with data streams or data sources or decision support tools or whatever. And how do they use that to process their decision making? Um, and so I, you know, I, I, you know, 
I'm curious to see how a place like UVA would maybe you know implement this. I've a colleague who's doing this research at University of Cincinnati, and it's it's fascinating to me. Um, you know, in the ICU, how do you make decision making about the data you're receiving about decisions you might make in a resuscitation, for example? Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be important that the learners see multiple examples of the failures so that they understand they have to take with a grain of salt. So the the algorithm may give them some idea and suggest a diagnosis, but they have to be able to validate that some way. And they need to see some harsh examples that are you know blatant failures so they realize, wow, it'd be really scary if I just trusted this algorithm because five percent of the time it's going to make me look really bad. And you know we've all seen seen examples uh, in the news about some classic failures. Um, one one I thought was particularly amusing was uh, to get rid of having a, a cameraman. They had a a camera with AI that would pan to follow a soccer ball in a soccer game. And I don't know if any of you saw this, but basically it was tracking a round object and it worked until they ended up with a sideline referee who was completely bald. And the camera <laughs> kept, uh, it was during a professional game, the camera kept moving away from the ball and over to the, the, the sideline referee because it was tracking his head. So, you know, maybe they put a hat on him and he's fine, but, you know, it might work every, it might have worked a hundred times that they tried it until you had that sideline referee. Or um, I, Vanderbilt was just in the news for using chat GPT for uh, crafting a, a statement uh, of sympathy in response to Michigan State shootings. And it, it was basically very focused on, this was an opportunity to focus on inclusion. I'm probably not getting that exactly right, but they released this email publicly and they got a lot of blowback because maybe they didn't really check it very thoroughly. But we've just got to be careful. We just use these things to help us, but you've got to validate it. Yeah, and it, it, to build on that, one, one of the concerns that we have at the American College of Radiology and Informatics Commission that I'm involved with is that um, if results get released too quickly, and there's now many platforms that do disseminate AI results quickly in the in the spirit of keeping the clinicians informed in real time, whether it's pulmonary embolism or you know a stroke, LVO, LVO occlusion. Um, it's done in a very good intent, but it's also uh, it also means that the communications, the rapid communications that are bolted on the result generator, totally circumvent the typical clinical pathway and the ability of clinicians to validate the result and really make sure that this is in fact present. So a, a well-intentioned um, adjunct tool of communication out to mobile platforms, people's cell phones and so forth, uh, really almost makes the AI function autonomously because the result is basically getting out there before the physician can validate it. So I, I would caution all of you in, in your institutions if, if, if people are are touting the the benefits of that to make sure that that there is a validation step and that people real clinicians are in the loop so how so how does this how does this um, reach into tracing for nurses for technologists for physical therapists for all for all the other sort of aspects of healthcare that you know we've just had our narrow grip on on uh, on our own areas um, Mike, is that in the sight line? Uh, yeah, that's in the sight. Definitely. We have a whole department on interprofessional learning simply because, like I said, I've got nursing, public health, pharmacy, and medical school. So we realizing that this type of stuff is, is, a, is a cost center, right, when you're trying to train these people. But we've invested in it because it's really the secret sauce for team building and interprofessional learning. And that's the vision beyond the vision. The vision we have, but what's the vision and how are we going to do just what you said so that this is democratized across the spectrum of healthcare providers and that this it does have, have an opportunity to get validated, as Christoph and Cree said, in a way that really ensures that a benefit is provided, not just some, you know, quick decision. We're coming up at the uh, at at the close of the hour, and I wanted to give anybody an opportunity to make any uh, additional remarks or closing comments, if you'd like. 
I so I, I I actually it's a it's a little bit of a question to the group. You know, one of the the we we're talking a lot about the clinicians, but on the other side, there's the data scientists, and you know. We, we've talked about some interactions with vendors and, and, and industry, but I think one of my big concerns is um, how do we keep our talent in academic medicine? So we've got data scientists, they go to the School of Data Science, they get a master's, they get a PhD, they're interested in working in healthcare. How do we keep them in an academic environment where they may make you know, $100,000, $120,000 a year, or they could go work at Google and make four or five times that. Um, that that's that to me is, uh, you know, something that we need to be thinking about as an institution. Because um, I think, the you know, the collaborations we have on grounds or within an institution, I think are going to be very, very important as we sort of build our own machine learning AI systems to impact clinical care. 100% right. That is a real challenge. And to be market competitive is not possible in many cases, but we have to constantly reassess our grids to make sure that not only do we have, you know, equity in our pay lines, but that we're really addressing what the market is. You know, this is a tough market for these type of yeah. people to bring into health, one, into one, academic health. Yeah. One, one way we've sort of tried to influence that is that I've certainly told and I think I've convinced my informaticists, for instance, that they're frontline healthcare workers. Radiology is a digital specialty. Without keeping the lights on on our computers, we cannot deliver patient care. So they consider themselves 24 seven healthcare workers. They're not just informaticists or data scientists or whatever it may be. So they actually have a higher sense of purpose and, and it's really working quite well. I think several of them could have gone somewhere else and they, and they really genuinely feel that they're in patient care and that's where they wanna be because it gives their, their life and their skill a meaning. Well, I think with that, we are uh, we're wrapping up on that uh, note. This was a fabulous discussion, everyone. I'm very grateful for you taking your time out tonight. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. Christoph, Michael, Cree, and of course, my thanks to Terry and Jordan for helping put this together. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.